Philippians chapter 1, uh, starting at verse 12 through to 26, and that's on page 1178 of the Church Bibles. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of self-ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up, stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out of, for my deliverance. I eagerly accept and hope that I will be no, in no way ashamed, for I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I de desire to depart and be with Christ, which is, far, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on, my, on account of me. Well, do have that uh, passage uh, that Rosie read for us uh, from Philippians uh, 1 uh, open. That would be really helpful. I don't know about you, but you, there's certain people, aren't there, who you find inspiring I don't know if you do that. You hear kind of stories of your life, of their life, and you, you find them inspiring. It seems over the past kind of uh, month or so, we've been hearing aspects of uh, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu's life. Um, and it's hard not to feel inspired in some ways by what he's done. And his fearlessness in uh, confronting the apartheid system in South Africa, uh, his setting up of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, listening to the way he would often, in that commission, listen to the, the horrific stories being told and be filled with uh, tears. Uh, and yet another friend, remembering the time when he used to have to ring him for the news uh, program he was on, he would ring him, and he was always there with a little joke um, and a smile on the other end uh, of the phone. It's easy to be encouraged, isn't it, and inspired by people's courage or their heroism. And this morning, I hope that as we come to Philippians 1, we will be encouraged and inspired by the Apostle Paul. But more than that, I hope that we will be encouraged and inspired by seeing what it was which drove Paul and allowed him to be like he was. Because as we read these verses, you may have thought that as, we, as Rosie read for us, these are quite remarkable verses as we hear about Paul's attitude and the first thing that I want us to, to see is Paul's uh, present example, his, uh, and he was uh, excited about gospel progress. And we see Paul rejoicing uh, again, he, and he is rejoicing in these verses because uh, the gospel is progressing, the gospel is advancing, and he is delighted about it. And so as he is writing this letter, the, uh, the kind of time he was writing the letter, as he looked around him and he sees the circumstances around him, he rejoices at what he saw. In verse 12, he says he wants the, 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 the readers, the Philippians, to know that his present circumstance has actually served to advance the gospel. It might have been that some in the community thought um, that his his imprisonment, his arrest and imprisonment would have actually served to detract from the gospel or cause the gospel to retreat. 
that Paul says, rather than hindering the gospel, my imprisonment, my um, uh, arrest has actually been for the growth of the gospel, for the advance of the gospel. Yes, he's confined, he's unable to move about uh, freely, but the gospel's not curtailed, the gospel is growing. His imprisonment has served to advance the gospel. There has been gospel progress. We see it in in two ways. Firstly, in verse uh, 13, Paul says, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. I said it before, we don't don't actually know where Paul was, um, for sure where Paul was imprisoned. I think it's probably most likely that he was imprisoned in Rome. Um, the final place where he was imprisoned, but he, we read he's imprisoned a number of times. But wherever he is, there's a palace guard who are um, they're looking after him. Some suggest maybe one of the guards each time was chained to Paul so that Paul couldn't get away. There's always a guard with him. Some commentators say there may have been up to 900 people in this palace guard. And what's the remarkable thing is, is that they have come to realize why Paul was imprisoned, that he's in chains for Christ. Now, it must be surely, isn't it, that Paul was just so different to the other prisoners that they would normally guard. Now, he's not carping on about his innocence the whole time. He's not some kind of slimy, tricky character who they can see deserves to be there. No, they hear him speaking all the time about Christ. A Jew who was crucified some years before, and he's speaking about the way in which Jesus came to die for those who were his enemies, that he was raised to life again. And the the whole palace guard hear about it, it, as it says in verse 13, and to everyone else. As the guards maybe met in the mess room and they're having a chat and a conversation, they're saying, what about that Paul? And they talk about why he's there in chains. They're hearing that Paul is imprisoned for Christ. The gospel is advancing among them. And at the end of this letter in chapter 4, right at the end, we read that Paul sends greetings to different people. And he says, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And it may be that those were some of the palace guard who were um, uh, guarding Paul. Becoming Christians through Paul's witness in chains. The gospel is advancing and Paul gives thanks for it. But secondly, it's not just among the pagan unbelievers, if you like, that the gospel is advancing. It's advancing among uh, the church because they have been emboldened to speak the gospel of Christ. Verse 14, and because of my chains... Most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul says the effect of his imprisonment on the church has been that they are more confident in the Lord. They are confident in God who is there, who is loving and kind. They've been transformed to preach the gospel without fear. I don't know, maybe it's that they were, they were timid and fearful. But now they dare to proclaim Christ without fear. It's easy, isn't it, to think that persecution and suffering might stop the gospel advancing. Now, if you imagine they got the train, maybe you can imagine the gospel like a train that's always moving. We sometimes think, don't we, that the persecution and suffering might stop that gospel train from advancing forward. But the gospel is always moving forward, always advancing. I heard somebody recently describe it as the, the gospel train. It's like, you know, when you watch these kind of action movies and there's always kind of some fights on top of the train. And, you know, so there's kind of, I don't know who it is. James Bond, the top of a train, fighting with uh, somebody else. Uh, and whatever the, the enemy throws at him, James Bond kind of keeps on going. But the other thing is that the train is always moving forward as well. The train is always advancing. And the persecution and the suffering doesn't stop it. And Paul rejoices because his imprisonment hasn't stopped the gospel, but has actually served to advance the gospel. But then we get these uh, rather... 
uh, strange verses in verses 15 to 18 because some of the brothers and sisters who've been proclaiming Christ do so out of love, we hear, but others out of envy and rivalry. Look at verse 15. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Seems remarkable, doesn't it? Of course, the gospel, we, we would hope, wasn't it, it'd be preached out of love and goodwill. And yet there were some who were preaching Christ with the intention of stirring up trouble for Paul, full of envy and rivalry. But then even more remarkably, in, in verse 18, Paul said, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Now, I think we need to kind of just push a little bit further into what these uh, people who are preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry are actually doing. And firstly, what Paul cannot mean. I don't think Paul, I think it's impossible for Paul to mean that these people were preaching a slightly different message to him. That they were preaching um, a slightly different gospel. And Paul will say, I don't really mind that they're preaching a slightly different gospel because at least they're preaching and talking about Jesus. I don't think he can be saying that because elsewhere in Paul, he is very strong that he has and what he preaches is the one true gospel. And anything else is false and to be rejected. And so I don't think he can be meaning here that these people are not quite preaching the true gospel, but at least, at least they're better than the real unbelievers. No, I think what actually these people are doing when they preach Christ out of envy and rivalry is, is that they hope that they can proclaim the true gospel, but in a way in which stirs up trouble for Paul. Maybe they are saying things which belittled Paul. Paul and his methods were wrong. We would have never have done all this to get arrested. He's just a bit too hot-headed, that Paul. A bit too gung-ho. Maybe they were envious of Paul's uh, position and prestige that he has. They were full of envy. And so when they see Paul in prison, they feel, huh, yeah, we would never have done that. We're a bit better than that, Paul secretly happy that things didn't go well with him. And I think it's an easy attitude for us to slip into as a church. That we are, maybe we become pleased that our church is doing well. And secretly we're actually quite pleased that the church down the road is not doing well. We're preaching the true gospel. But we're doing it out of envy and rivalry. Or we are secretly pleased when difficulty comes to another ministry and when something goes wrong with that ministry. But I think remarkably for Paul here, he says, but the gospel is progressing. So whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And I'm going to rejoice in that. Because Paul's desire and his motivation in the present was to see the gospel advance. And he was thankful and delighting in that. But secondly, the next thing we see in the passage is that Paul continues to rejoice in verse 18. And he does that as he considers his future. So our second point, Paul's future hope, gospel deliverance. Now in the next verses, we find Paul moving from that considering of his present circumstances to looking uh, to the future. And look what he says in the second half, from the second half of verse 18. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He says, what's happened to me, my, my imprisonment, the circumstances that I'm in will turn out for my deliverance in the future. And he's not meaning here his release from prison. 
uh, he, in a moment he will show that he thinks it's a possibility that he might die in prison. Now that word for deliverance there is really the word salvation. And it's a word which normally refers to a person's uh, deliverance as they stand before God in the final judgment day when they will be saved and set free. And God will say, welcome, good and faithful servant. And Paul is saying, therefore, as I think about the future, I know my future is secure. Whatever the jailers who are holding me now decide to do to me, whether they release me or whether I die, my future is secure. That these circumstances around me will turn out for my deliverance. You can imagine Paul, he's sitting in his uh, prison cell, thinking about the future. And what brings him comfort and hope as he uh, sits there? Well, what he brings him comfort and hope is that his eternal security is sure. He knows that whatever happens in the future, the one thing which is sure is that he will be delivered, he will be saved. And so he looks to the future with a wonderful confidence, rejoicing whatever might come. And the same is true for any believer in the Lord Jesus. We too have that wonderful and amazing confidence in, in, in the future as we look forward. Uh, this week I've been uh, working my way through uh, 1 Timothy in my uh, quiet times and listening to some talks uh, some talks a chap gave uh, in January 2020. In one of the talks, it was quite striking because he said, we don't know what this year is going to bring. We don't know what's going to be ahead for us, which is true, isn't it? But listening to that talk from January 2020 now, it just brought it home to me all the more. He was saying, we don't know what the year is going to bring, how we're going to um, find life, what we're going to do. But we can be sure of whatever happens, our security and our deliverance in Christ is sure. And so Paul, as he looked forward, he had that confidence in Christ. But you see, Paul's not confident just in his own kind of self-contained spiritual resources. Did you see what he said? I know that through your prayers... And God's provision of the Spirit of Christ, Jesus. See, Paul's not saying, no, I'm strong, I'm powerful. I, I know I'm going to be able to uh, stay strong in Christ right until the end and I'm going to be fine because I'm a superhero. And he's not kind of boasting in his self-contained spiritual resources. No, he needed the prayers of the brothers and sisters in Christ. He needed God's Spirit, which was given to him. To give him the confidence to keep going. You see Paul's example here. It's right for us to have confidence in the Lord. But it's wrong for us to have self-confidence. I remember chatting to a guy at a church once. He was um, yeah, a nice lad. He wasn't really coming to church very much. And I, I said I was worried for him. And I don't remember his words. They stuck in my mind. He says, I'll never stop being a Christian. That's what I've been brought up to do. I'll never stop being a Christian. And the words as he spoke them, it just thought, wow, what self-confidence he had in himself. It wasn't looking to Christ. It wasn't relying on God's spirit. It wasn't saying, well, you pray for me that I will keep going. And I think the same is true for us. It's a reminder that we need to be praying for each other. A reminder that we need to be relying on God's provision of his spirit as we confidently face the future. And so we see Paul rejoicing in this passage because of his present and seeing the gospel progress that was happening. We see he's confident in the future because of gospel salvation. And then right at the end of the chapter, we see his ambitions for the future which are gospel determined. Paul's future plans are gospel determined. As he looks to the, the future, as he thinks about what he might do in the future, whether it's life or death, we 
we, we get a kind of glimpse into his uh, decision-making, his thinking, and how he goes about making those decisions. Listening again from verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living on the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. You see his dilemma that he's kind of wrestling with here. He says, well, if, if I die, well, all, all's better. I'll go and be with Christ. That's better by far. But if I, if I remain alive, well, that'll mean fruitful labor for me. There will be gospel ministry for me to undertake and that will advance the gospel and that will be good for you. And he says, what shall I choose between the going to be with Christ, which is better, or staying and serving you with the gospel? He says, I don't know. I think what he means there is that he's got no word from God on that. What does God want? Well, he doesn't know. God's not revealed to him whether he will live and carry on in gospel ministry or whether he will die in captivity. He said no word from God on it. And yet as he reflects on his situations and what he might do and what it might bring for him, I think his decision making is instructive and countercultural for us. Because you see how he reasons? Going to be with the Lord, well that's going to be better for me. That's going to be the best thing for Paul personally, to be with the Lord, to be with God. However, as he goes on reason, reasoning, he knows that if he were to remain alive, it would mean fruitful ministry for him. He would continue serving brothers and sisters in Christ, telling unbelievers the gospel, and that would be fruitful and good. And so as he reasons, as he goes on reasoning, he says, well, to remain alive would be better. Because I can continue serving other people. So verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. See, what's best for him personally, going to be with the Lord, becomes a secondary consideration. Because primarily, he thinks, I can be of service and help to the brothers and sisters in Christ. Of course, we know Paul did eventually uh, die. God chose to take Paul to be with himself. But Paul's desire, his decision-making, was all about the gospel and the progress it could make. It made me think about myself this week, and maybe you can uh, think, well, does that... Um, would that characterize my decision making? When I think about the future and the plans I make for the future, do I think what's going to be best for me personally? Or do I think what's going to be good for other people in Christ, my brothers and sisters, for the church, for gospel progress? What's going to make uh, the best for them? It's quite a challenge, isn't it, I think? And so in these verses, we are presented with this startling, I think, and quite surprising portrait of the apostle rejoicing, even though he's in prison, because he sees the gospel progressing in the unbelieving world, but also within the church. Rejoicing, even though some people are preaching Christ so as to try and cause trouble for him, but rejoicing because the gospel is progressing. And as he thinks about his future, Rejoicing because he knows that whatever happens, his imprisonment or his release, whatever happens, he's not going to be abandoned by God, but he will be delivered and saved. As he thinks about his future, he thinks, well, whether I live, that will be better for me, or whether I carry on ministry, both means um, are, are the right good things, 
I will choose, if I can, gospel ministry because that will be better for others. I think Paul's poetry here is meant to inspire and encourage us. But I think only if we actually understand what it is that is driving Paul to make these kind of choices and kind of statements. And it's kind of what I've been alluding to all the way through. It's because of the gospel. Paul had a gospel outlook. You see, when we understand that, we see that it's not some kind of strange thing that Paul was doing, which is way out of our league. But something which we too could be like. But only if the gospel is the thing which we have grasped and are living for. You see, Paul is delighted that the gospel is advancing. He is uh, pleased that his future is secure because of the gospel. He makes gospel decisions for the future. It's all about the gospel, the gospel of God's Son, the Lord Jesus. The gospel which demonstrates that we are loved that there is, there is one God among all the fake and false gods that people say are gods. There is one true God who came and showed himself to us. And as he came and showed himself to us, we saw that this sovereign, powerful God who is pure and holy and righteous and can tolerate evil is also loving and kind and patient. And compassionate with us, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love for us. That he, as he came, he demonstrated that yes, he's got all this authority and power, yet he came to serve people. Serve people who would have been considered his enemies. Loving them before they even showed any kind of hope for loving him dying in their place, bearing the judgment for their sin so that they could go free, so they could live at peace with God, could have hope for eternal life. That when God came and showed himself, he didn't say to us, pull up your socks, try harder, be more like me. No, he said, look, I've come and done everything for you. Trust in me for salvation for your souls. Come to me, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me and find forgiveness and love and peace with God which you never could have imagined would have come. And Paul, the apostle who later in in different places describes himself as the, the worst of sinners, trusted in that gospel and it transformed him. And we see what the transformation is like in these verses. That he's willing to suffer so that that wonderful gospel news could go out to more people. Rejoicing that more people were hearing of Jesus and the love that he has for us. Be willing to, to suffer insult and injury to his own reputation in person if the gospel was being proclaimed to others. Being liberated from competition with others. Of thinking that he must show how much better he is than others and show how much more religious zeal he has than others. Just delighted that people were hearing about Jesus. Delighted that that was happening, even if it caused him hardship. That he could have hope in the darkest places because of that gospel which brought him the hope. That he could reason if he were to remain alive, then that would be good because I could tell more people about the love that God has for us. The attitude of Paul here is underlied and undergirded by the gospel. And for us this morning, I think this passage is meant to be an encouragement and an, uh, to, to be like Paul in a way. But it's not an encouragement to say, just try harder, pull up your socks, be more uh, zealous in religious things. 
You know, it's a call for us to understand the gospel more. To see that the God who is true and there loves you and has done everything for you. And as we learn this gospel message, the unstoppable force that is moving forward all the time in the world, as we learn that and as we uh, internalize that, then we will become more filled with the attitude that Paul demonstrates here. I think this is a call for us to really understand the gospel. And we're going to do that now as we come to a communion. Communion is a, a time where we remember the gospel as we uh, eat bread, reminding us of Jesus' body, which was shed for us, as we drink the, the, the wine or the juice, which reminds us of Jesus' blood, which was shed for us, as we see, in a sense, before our very eyes, God's love uh, demonstrated for us. As we, uh, as we eat the bread and drink the wine, we say, it's just as real as this is in my mouth now, so real is Jesus who came and died and rose and ascended. And so as we come to this time, I'm going to um, just begin it by reading some Bible verses, which I hope will draw out some more just to remind us of the wonderful truths of the gospel. It might be just in this time of uh, quiet and reflection, you, you can shut your eyes or uh, just listen along. But listen to these uh, words and then be encouraged by them. So Mark ten forty five, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Romans five eight, God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ, Jesus our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Your work is alive.
Forever 